Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the 22nd annual Brennan Lecture on State Courts and Social Justice, which is sponsored by the Opperman Institute of Judicial Administration here at the law school. I want to thank, first of all, the IJA's faculty directors, uh, Oscar Chase, as well as Sam Estreicher. Is Sam here? Okay. Um, as well as on leave, uh, Troy McKenzie. Um, I, I don't know if that's a title, faculty director on leave, but let's pretend it is. Um, I also want to thank the executive director, Tori Whitman, um, who really uh, took the laboring oar in organizing this evening's event. Um, and want to welcome the Honorable Eric Washington, Chief Judge of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Um, he'll be introduced in just a moment, but want to say how grateful uh, we are to you for being here tonight, uh, Judge. Now, just a few words, uh, history of the IJA, uh, known to many of you, but it is a remarkable history. For more than 60 years, IJA has played a major role in judicial education in this country, in outreach to the legal profession, and in empirical and theoretical research concerning the justice system, both civil and criminal, as a university-based educational research organization that seeks to bridge the worlds of theory and practice, which is what we do a lot here at NYU, IJA is committed to improving the system of the administration of justice rather than advancing the positions of just particular interest groups on one side or another of an issue. Uh, and it's done that to great effect. More than one-third of all appellate judges in the United States are alumni of the IJA's judicial training programs, and almost 90% of all U.S. appellate courts have at least one IJA alumnus or alumna currently sitting. Those are astonishing numbers, and numbers uh, to be very proud of. Now, the Brennan Lecture uh, provokes each year reflection upon and celebration of the state judiciary the bedrock of justice under law in the United States. It is in many ways a complement and a partner to our Madison lecture here, um, which each year features typically a member of the federal judiciary speaking on an important matter uh, of national legal consequence. And so the Brennan lecture then brings uh, to the law school leaders within the state judiciary, uh, likewise to offer their perspectives. And it's named, of course, for Justice William Brennan. Uh, few Americans have done as much to shape the constitutional order of vigorous civil liberties and respect for the rule of law as Justice Brennan. In his 34 years on the Supreme Court, uh, he sculpted a vast constitutional jurisprudence and elevated the judiciary's role in enforcing uh, America's commitment to individual rights and justice. His professional experiences informed his keen appreciation of our federal system and his abiding vision of the independent responsibility of state courts to protect constitutional rights. And this is a point that's sometimes forgotten when remembering Justice Brennan, given his long tenure on the US Supreme Court, is how important a voice he was for the significance of the state judiciary, not only in upholding state constitutional commitments, but in upholding federal constitutional commitments as well, and so uh, it's, I think, only appropriate uh, that this lecture series is named for him. It's also poignant tonight to note that the very first Brennan lecturer and a driving force behind the creation of this lecture series was our graduate, Judith Kay, um, who, I'm, as I'm sure all of you know, passed away earlier this year. We remember her with great fondness and pride um, as a part of the history of this lecture series, and of course, one of this country's great leaders in the state judiciary, given her service in New York. Uh, so now it's my great pleasure to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Chief Justice Stuart Rabner of New Jersey, like Justice Brennan, a New Jerseyan. Um, Chief Justice Rabner is the eighth Chief Justice to lead the New Jersey Supreme Court, having been nominated in 2007. He came to the court having had a distinguished career, including government service in both federal and state government, um, having served as first assistant U.S. attorney, chief of the terrorism unit. He was named chief counsel, then to Governor Corzine uh, in January of 2006, and then went from there uh, to the court in 2007. He is a member of the board of directors of IJA and a great friend to IJA. So please join me in welcoming uh, Chief Justice Stuart Rabner. Thank you, Dean, for those words, and thank you and the law school for embracing and continuing the important work of IJA. Those statistics are impressive about 
how many appellate judges participate, and I can tell you that we in New Jersey do our best to boost those numbers. Um, the New Jersey Supreme Court has not one, but 100% participation. All of my colleagues have, have gone through the program, and I think each of them would tell you how beneficial it is to them. So thank you, and Oscar, and Sam, and um, you know, for, for continuing this remarkably important work. It was 40 years ago this May that Justice Brennan delivered an important lecture at the New Jersey State Bar Association's annual convention. At that point in his career, he had gone from shaping majority opinions to more often writing in dissent. That speech, which was later published in a law review journal, is credited with helping jumpstart the Renaissance in state constitutional law, so much so that today, as we heard, it's not unusual for state courts to be basing their decisions on constitutional questions, on heightened protections that constitutions in their states afford. Now, given that, that, of course, is one of the reasons that this lecture series is named for him, and given that backdrop, we often focus on decisions of state Supreme Courts when we talk about them and social justice. But equally important are some of the reform efforts underway in states throughout the nation efforts to improve our civil and criminal justice systems. Washington, D.C. and the District of Columbia Court of Appeals headed by Chief Judge Eric Washington, now serving in his third term, has led the way in a number of important areas, perhaps none more important than the efforts in the area of pretrial release. As other states, like Kentucky and Arizona, Colorado and New Jersey embark on similar programs, we look to the District of Columbia's local system as a guide, and we look to Chief Judge Washington as a source of knowledge, of wisdom, of experience. And that's why we are so fortunate to be able to hear from him this evening, someone in the spirit of the path-breaking work that Justice Brennan envisioned many, many years ago. Now, Chief, Justice Was Chief Judge Washington is far too energetic to limit his efforts solely to the issues of pretrial release. In fact, I think of him as sort of a more gracious, uh, far more thoughtful energizer bunny. And here's why. He's not only responsible for administering the court system in the Washington, D.C. area, where he has enhanced access to the courts, reduced the time for handling of cases on appeal, embraced the use of new technologies, but he's also served as a leader on the national level, as a former president of the National Council, uh, the Conference of Chief Justices, an organization that he remains an active voice in, as a member of various boards and committees that focus on the Criminal Justice Act on child abuse and neglect. He's also a board member of the National Courts and Science Institute and the Boys and Girls Club for the Greater Washington Foundation. On top of all of that, he's written extensively, both as chief and as an associate judge beforehand. His opinions cover all areas of law, family and criminal in particular, and if you take a look at some of his recent opinions in criminal law, they dovetail nicely with the reform efforts that he has led. Some recent decisions, relating to Miranda rights, to the safeguards for searches in the privacy of one's home, to when and whether police have the right acting on an informant's tip to search, to f stop and frisk a citizen. All of those and other opinions give a sense of his belief in the importance of upholding the rule of law and his abiding sense of fairness. In the same breath, you can see his interest and his experience in the efforts that he undertook before becoming a judge. He served as principal deputy in the Office of Corporation Counsel in Washington, D.C., as legislative director for a United States congressman, an associate and a partner at two renowned firms, and before all of that, a graduate from Tufts and a very fine law school in New York City that tonight will go nameless. <laughs> Just one more thing. If we put all of that aside, all of the accomplishments that are the types of things you would read on a CV, um, if you ever get a chance to work with Eric Washington, you'll come away inspired by his warmth, by the gentle and reassuring way about him, the fact that he always has a good word, and his, his fundamental decency, humanity, and humility. And that's why so many voices in the legal community look up to him as a friend. It is an honor to introduce Chief Judge Washington to deliver tonight's 22nd Brennan Lecture. Chief. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is certainly um, a pleasure to be here this evening. I am particularly honored to have been asked to deliver this 22nd annual William J. Brennan, Jr. Lecture 
on state courts and social justice. I want to thank Professors Chase and Estricker and, just, and Professor McKinsey for the invitation to join you this evening. And I am so pleased to have been introduced by my good friend, uh, Stuart Rabner, the Chief Justice of New Jersey. I am originally from New Jersey, so it is a particular and special privilege to have him introduce me. And frankly, um, uh, it, I want to thank you for how warm and overly generous uh, that, that introduction was. But I, I do appreciate it, and I want you to know that. Whether it concerns the critical importance of ensuring meaningful access to justice, or efforts by state courts to restructure its business processes to better provide timely, cost-effective, and just civil case resolution for everyone, or whether it's how states grapple with and resolve very difficult legal issues, like the admissibility of eyewitness identification evidence in light of challenges to the reliability of that evidence in stranger and cross-racial identification confrontations, state courts across the country continue to strive to meet the needs of communities we serve and address the very difficult legal and social justice issues that are critical to making equal justice under the law a reality for everyone. All too often, however, the important work of state courts and the extraordinary per, uh, talent that can be found on those courts are as overlooked, as is the situation currently when discussing potential candidates to replace Justice Antonin Scalia on the United States Supreme Court. Many people don't know that 49 of the 112 justices who, served on, who have served on the United States Supreme Court have had either state trial or state appellate court experience. However, since the retirement of Justice Souter, no one on the United States Supreme Court currently brings jurisprudential experience from America's state courts, where more than 95% of all cases brought in this country are filed. So I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to thank NYU, Dean Morrison, and the Dwight D. Opperman Institute of Justice Administration for providing opportunities for state court leaders like myself to publicly address the fundamentally important role that state courts play in addressing social problems and in delivering equal justice. My topic tonight, state courts and the promise of pretrial justice in criminal cases provides another example of how state court leadership is, is working to address important social justice issues. Two generations ago, the United States Department of Justice decried the way money extorted the pretrial process, giving succor to the wealthier defendants while unduly penalizing the poor. In fact, it was back in 1964 when then Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy in testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee in support of bail reform legislation said, and I quote, the legislation you consider today is new evidence of the deep concern of Congress that all Americans receive equal treatment in our courts. Whatever their wealth, the problem simply stated is the rich man and the poor man do not receive equal justice in our courts. And in no area is this more evident than in the matter of bail. We presume a person to be innocent until he's proven guilty, and thus, the purpose of bail is not punishment. It is not to keep people in jail. It is simply to guarantee, at that time, their appearance in court. In practice, however, bail has become a vehicle for systematic injustice. Every year in this country, thousands of persons are kept in jail for weeks and even months following arrest. They are not yet proven guilty. They may no longer be likely, they may, they may be no more likely to flee than you or I, but most of them, must stay in jail because, to be blunt, they cannot afford to pay for their freedom." End quote. He then went on to talk about the other costs associated, or the other costs to the accused and to society, pointing out that millions of dollars were being spent on food, care, clothing, and what he refers to as constantly growing detention facilities, an issue that my daughter is been very interested in for many years and uh, has helped me to understand even better, and I'm so pleased that she's here. Um, but he also focuses, I think, most powerfully on the human cost, which he states is incalculable. Quote, the man who must wait in jail before trial often loses his job. He will lose his freedom to help prepare his own defense, and he will lose his self-respect. 
His conclusion, citing to the findings that came out of a national conference he helped to convene here in New York in conjunction with the Vera Foundation, was that the system was in drastic need of overhauling. Here we are today, more than 50 years later, and the ills and injustices discussed so eloquently by Attorney General Kennedy and his testimony before that Senate Judiciary Committee are as true today in many jurisdictions around the country as they were in 1964. Unfortunately, the numbers that General Kennedy used to highlight the magnitude of the problem pale, and I use that term advisedly, in comparison to the number of individuals being held pretrial in our jails and prisons today, merely because they are poor. Today, those individuals are disproportionately people of color who have been arrested for nonviolent and or quality of life crimes and are primarily low level, low risk individuals. However, regardless of the race of those being held in jails pretrial, the common thread among all of them is that they are in jail merely because they are too poor to pay a money bond. Thus begging the question, why in 2016 are we having to mount yet another campaign to reform this, this key part of our criminal justice system when the injustices associated with that system were well known to everyone more than 50 years ago? Perhaps it's because the concept of money bail is broadly misunderstood or because it's perhaps it's because judges, uneasy about the presumption of justice, pre presumption of innocence, and the limited authority and resources at their disposal to otherwise address issues of dangerousness, decided to use the authority they did have in a way that was inconsistent with its purpose. Regardless of the motivation, and despite at least two generational efforts to reform the system, recent calls for reform have become more urgent and insistent, and more and more state court leaders are beginning to heed the call, recognizing that the law is committed to protecting the basic rights of both the accused and the accuser. In the 1960s, the Vera Institute of Justice conducted the Manhattan Bail Project. Its findings led Attorney General Kennedy to convene a national con symposium on ways to solve the problem of pretrial over-incarceration. That study confirmed that many defendants being held on money bonds presented a low risk of failing to appear for court, and that those defendants performed well on pretrial release, sometimes needing only a minimal amount of support in the way of court date reminders and occasional check-ins. That groundbreaking work led to the passage of the Bail Reform Act of 1966, the first generation of bail reform efforts. That effort led to the standardization or at least the recognition of individual release, pretrial release factors. Those factors included consideration of a defendant's background and community ties. It also stipulated that the pretrial release decision should be made with the presumption of release and release under the least restrictive conditions necessary to ensure that the defendant would show up to court. That bail reform didn't catch on. Money was still being used. Fast forward to the 1980s, and 20 years after Kennedy's call for reform, the Federal Bail Act of 1984 was passed. For the first time, dangerousness was recognized as a valid pretrial release factor that should be considered when courts are trying to determine who should be released into the community. It seems like common sense to us now, but prior to that, the only, the only factors that address the likelihood of a defendant returning for his or her next scheduled court appearance could legally be considered in the context of bail. Soon after that decision, nearly every state adopted language that allowed judges to consider both flight and danger as part of their bail decisions. However, a few states are still lagging behind, including New York, which still doesn't have a consideration of dangerousness written into its state bail statute. I'll return to that in a little while. A few years later, in 1987, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its opinion in United States versus Salerno. In that case, the Supreme Court affirmed the right of federal courts to detain dangerous individuals without the opportunity for release, as long as certain due process protections were observed. However, in that opinion, former Chief Justice Rehnquist made it perfectly clear that, quote, in our society, liberty is the norm and detention prior to trial or without trial is a carefully limited exception. I recently read an, uh, an article published um, by the um, 
National Institute of Corrections. It was written by Timothy R. Schnacke, the executive director of the Center for Legal and Evidence-Based Practices. The publication was entitled The Fundamentals of Bail. And in his introduction, he discusses what he sees as a paradox within the criminal justice system that has been created by how we have articulated and used our system of bail. He points out that bail was created and molded over the centuries in England and in the United States, primarily to facilitate the release of criminal defendants from jail while they await trial. But that today, those same practices often operate to deny the release. He points to the frequent tagline in newspaper articles that read like, the defendant is being held on $50,000 bail. We all see it, we see it every day. He cites to that as support for his contention or his, 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 his paradoxical theory. He notes that the statement, the defendant is being held on $50,000 bail, is outwardly false because, as we know, bail was created to facilitate the release of defendants. But that upon closer examination, the statement turns out to be absolutely true. Now, while he's content to point out the paradox, it may be that this fundamental misconception, one that is perpetuated daily through, <clears throat> excuse me, the news and through social media, contributes to the difficulties faced by those who want to move forward on pretrial justice reform. Because of the tension between the purpose of bail as a way of releasing those accused of a crime pretrial and the desire of judges to protect the community from any further harm by an accused, the um, whether for personal or political reasons, Courts over time have come to rely on important criminal jurisprudential mechanisms like preliminary hearings or habeas corpus and prohibitions on pretrial detentions without charge as a way of protecting the due process rights of an accused who's being detained in violation of the very policies underlying the concept of bail. And we are certainly happy that the courts have utilized those mechanisms to protect those rights of people being held, the problem is they're still being held. And therefore, those mechanisms are actually masking the problem and have masked the problem for many years of using money as a mechanism to improperly detain criminal defendants pretrial. And judges, over time, have not been the greatest champions of change. And why is that? Because the degree of comfort that is enjoyed by state trial judges, where again, 95% of, of justice is meted out in America, on, uh, in terms of their pretrial release decisions, are not based on considerations of factors that can later be questioned and criticized, but their pretrial decisions are being based almost exclusively on the severity of the crime which with the defendant has been charged, even though we understand that that person is presumed innocent. As we all know, the public quickly forgets the old adage to err is human, to forgive divine, when someone whom the courts have considered a good candidate for release is subsequently accused of committing another crime while awaiting trial. Judges who are elected to office are especially sensitive to that potential outcome. So it's not surprising that state court judges have not in the past jumped at the opportunity to lead reform efforts in this regard. However, in recent years, an awareness has arisen about the enormous impact this often quickly made pretrial decision has on defendants and the criminal justice system. Members of the judiciary are re-examining their reluctance to advocate for change in this area, and state court chief justices and state court administrators have begun playing pivotal roles in beginning the discussions about how best to handle accused individuals between arrest and the disposition of their cases. This willingness to tackle issues of bail reform are being driven by a new understanding on the part of judges about the actual risks involved in releasing people back into the community pending trial. This new understanding is fueled by evidence-based and validated social science that is empowering judicial leaders to take the lead in promoting reforms in their states. Uh, these reforms can, significantly, can result in significantly lowering the number of people detained pretrial while better ensuring the long-term safety of their communities. The empirical data underlying evidence-based risk assessments has been tested and validated and confirms the experience gathered in jurisdictions like mine, the District of Columbia, over the last 20 years. Years ago, D.C. 
took a lead, in role, a lead role in promoting pretrial social justice by reforming its pretrial justice system. I mentioned earlier that Robert Kennedy testified about the need for bail reform by referencing the thousands of poor people being held pretrial on money bonds. What I didn't mention was that one of the jurisdictions prominently criticized for the improper use of money was the District of Columbia. At that time in DC, like everywhere else in America, money bonds were a judge's tool of choice in making pretrial release decisions. And often those decisions were made based on what was commonly understood to be the appropriate amount of bail for a particular crime. They didn't consider um, much more uh, than that number and that didn't consider that didn't consider much more than the that did and that of course considers not much more than the charged offense. Unfortunately, that didn't change for the District of Columbia when after the 1960s when our jurisdiction was reorganized when our court system was reorganized by Congress and given jurisdiction comparable to other state court systems in the in 1970 because at that time despite we were also given the first, a first in the nation pretrial detention statute. Trial judges overwhelmingly continued, however, to use money bonds for felony cases. Bail bondsmen flourished and their offices lined the streets uh, adjoining our courthouses. Why? Because that pretrial detention statute required the government to prove by a substantial probability that the accused had actually committed the crime for which he or she had been arrested and then, if the government met that burden at the hearing, the criminal trial had to begin within 60 days of the detention decision. Since judges in the district were using money anyway, uh, and those bonds were acting as detainers for most of the detention eligible defendants, as late as 1990, two thirds of defendants statutorily eligible for preventive detention were given money bonds instead. While it's the case that many of those detention eligible defendants remain detained, because of their inability to post the mandated bond amounts, it is also the case that there were some very dangerous people with access to resources who were able to purchase their freedom pre-trial and of course, the posting of money as they left the jailhouse made them no less dangerous than they were when they were arrested. In the early 1990s, after a rash of highly visible and serious crimes were committed allegedly involving persons released on money bonds, Growing concern about the often randomly unsafe character of our money bond pretrial release decision making led, the vis led our director of pretrial services agency, his name was Jay Carver, to form a coalition to reform our pretrial practices that included not only the prosecutors, but the director of the DC pretrial services agency, DC public defender service. They convinced the DC council to pass reform legislation that included a revised preventive detention statute that required that only required a judicial officer to find by clear and convincing evidence that no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably assure the appearance of the person as required and the safety or any other person of any other person and the community. The judicial officer under that statute could order that the person be detained, but that individual had an automatic and immediate right to appeal to the Court of Appeals. And the Court of Appeals had the right to, infor to instruct that trial judge that the record did not support a finding that the person was uh, clear and present danger and that person could be released and could order that person to be, re be released. As importantly, as important as that provision, which now made it at least a bit more tenable to take dangerous people off the street or people who were likely and through evidence, based on evidence uh, uh, not to return to court, as important was the fact that the legislation also included language that was taken from the 1984 Federal Bail Reform Act, which provided that judges could use money bonds only as long as it did not, quote, result in pretrial detention of the person. Because preventive detention options, although expanded, uh, still were only available in limited circumstances, and because money bonds could no longer be used to detain those accused of crimes, judges in the District of Columbia were forced to determine what level of risk an individual presented and order the appropriate level of community supervision to ensure both that the accused would return for his or her court dates and that they would not reoffend the twin goals now of bail. With the passage of that reform legislation, money bonds began to lose their efficacy in our courthouse and consequently bail bondsmen disappeared from the streets of Washington, D.C. Judges began to rely 
on risk assessment information developed by DC's pretrial service agency and its recommendations regarding effective schemes for community supervision for those individuals. And the results are in, ladies and gentlemen, and they are quite frankly comparable to anywhere in the country. Over the last three years, over 91% of persons arrested in the District of Columbia have been released on their own personal recognizance or under the supervision of the district's pretrial services agency. Of those defendants who were released back into the community, in 2015, for example, 89% remained arrest-free during the pretrial period, and only 2% of those who committed a crime while on release, that's 2% of the 11% who did not remain arrest-free, committed a violent crime. Further, fully 88% of those who were released pretrial made all of their scheduled court appearances during the pretrial period. And as of this past Friday, the DC jail was at 50% capacity and no one accused of a crime in the District of Columbia is being forced to wait, await their trial in the DC jail simply because they cannot afford to buy their freedom. The impacts of this kind of pretrial justice reform go well beyond the cost savings, although we understand that the cost savings are important to driving this issue home to, to, the, to executives and legislature, legislators in, in, our, in the respective states that we serve. But the impacts of this kind of pretrial justice, as I pretrial pre reform, justice reform go, as I said, well beyond those discussed by Attorney General, General Kennedy in his Senate testimony and in his other public statements. We now know that pretrial ju judicial decisions about the release or detention of defendants can impact nearly every aspect of the case that follows, much more so than previously imagined. Compared to similar defendants who get released, detained defendants are more likely to be found guilty, more likely to be sentenced to longer, to, more likely to be sentenced to incarceration, and more likely to receive longer sentences of incarceration. It is believed that pretrial detention drives up false guilty pleas from those who simply want to get out of jail and return to their families and their jobs. And every false guilty plea equals an individual unnecessarily saddled with a criminal record. And in cases of property or violent crime, an actual perpetrator who has evaded justice. Moreover, recent research by the Arnold Foundation, in which they applied an empirically based risk assessment tool to cases that had already been disposed of, has given us more information on the fallacy of use, using money to determine bail. First, nearly half of those who were released pretrial in this study on money bonds provided by bail bondsmen were found to score as high risk for pretrial failure that is, for missing court or being rearrested. So the folks we should be holding are getting out, and usually with minimal or no supervision because they have access to money. The flip side of the Arnold research showed that for low and medium risk defendants who were detained prior to detained pretrial because they couldn't pay their money bond, the likelihood of future criminality actually increased the longer they stayed in jail, and, it, and in fact, it was measurable after only two days in jail, pre-trial, waiting to get out. By continuing to criminalize poverty, we also threaten to undermine advances towards social justice in other areas. For example, the bench and the justice system as a whole have been working to restore pro-social factors like employment, housing, and community connection after release from incarceration at reentry. Here in New York City, Red Hook has been allowed as one of the most successful reentry courts in the country. And the fact that we all know what the term reentry means is a testament to just how pervasive that concept has become in the justice lexicon. Lexicon, excuse me. But while we have been working to support pro-social re justice reforms on the back end of our criminal justice system, our pretrial systems have been weakening those same factors before trial, while defendants are still presumed innocent. The new research in this area, of which the Arnold Foundation work is just a part, is eye-opening because it confirms a lot of what we've suspected for some time, but may have accepted as the cost of public safety. 
We understand now that these practices don't serve public safety at all. Oftentimes, it's just the opposite. Now, while I've highlighted and talked a little bit about uh, the work that the Arnold Foundation is doing, um, they're not alone. Other philanthropic organizations, such as the Public Welfare Foundation, I'm so pleased that Mary McClymouth, the head of the Public Welfare Foundation, is here with us today, and the MacArthur Foundation have also committed large sums of money to fund research and advocacy to explore and to, and to develop solutions to this issue of pretrial detention. Because they well understand the connection between the indiscriminate detention of poor people and its impact on families living near or at the poverty line. They also understand the importance of spreading the world that word that pretrial justice can no longer be an afterthought if we want to meaningfully improve our justice systems and reduce mass incarceration because 62% of the people being held in jail are being held pretrial. The federal government has also become invested with the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the National Institute of Corrections seeding programs to test and demonstrate alternatives to traditional bail practice. So with all of this activity, having gone through the 1960s first generation, the 1980s second generation, and now with this activity, I think we can say without fear of contradiction that there is a third generation, there is a movement of pretrial reform, and it's one that I'm quite pleased to say the state courts are helping to lead now. <clears throat> In 2012, the Conference of State Court Administrators, or COSCA, released a policy paper entitled Evidence-Based Pretrial Release and conducted some judicial outreach and education about their findings and conclusions. This paper laid out the essential components of, a, of, a re, of, a, of an appropriate evidence-based pretrial practice, and those findings were later adopted in a resolution by the Conference of Chief Justices. The paper issued a call to action to state court leaders to take several steps to improve the pretrial justice systems in their states, including engaging in the collaborative process to support risk-based release decisions, ensuring that non-financial release alternatives are available, ensuring that financial release options are available without the requirement of a surety. State court leaders were also asked to engage in outreach and education on the issue, to promote the use of data in guiding practices and to reduce reliance on bail schedules in favor of evidence-based assessments of pretrial risk of flight and threats to public safety. Already, some of our st state court chief justices have, have taken up the challenge of this so-called call to action driving important changes in their state's pretrial rules and practices. More than 20 states have adopted or are in the process of implementing a public safety assessment as part of their pretrial risk assessment with assistance from the Arnold Foundation. Here in New York, former Chief Judge Jonathan Lippman called for an overhaul of the state's bail system, citing a huge number of defendants being held before trial, un unable to pay nominal bond amounts, a few of these cases have hit the headlines in recent years, I know most of you know this, such as the case involving Khalif Browder and Jerome Murdoff. Now the governor has laid out plans to bring the state statute in line with most of the rest of the country in the federal system by including danger as a legitimate and transparent consideration for judges at bail. Court leaders in New York are also implementing several new initiatives to promote bail system reform. Those measures include the automatic judicial review of bail for misdemeanor cases in which the defendant is unable to post bail, post bond, the periodic judicial review of felony cases for case viability, readiness for trial, and corresponding modifications to the defendant's bail status. Teams from Arizona, Idaho, Indiana, and Wisconsin are working on action plans they developed during the pretrial justice policy forum convened by the National Center for State Courts funded by the Public Welfare Foundation and held a few years ago in Washington, D.C. As a result of Chief Just Justice Scott Bale's leadership in Arizona, they are expanding the use of the Arnold Foundation's risk assessment tool statewide uh, after testing it in a few pilot sites. With the expanded use of the Arnold Foundation's validated risk assessment tool, judges across Arizona will finally be able to better objectively assess whether defendants can be released back into their communities pre-trial. Across the river in New Jersey, bail reform has taken root and is moving full steam ahead, thanks in no small part to the judicial leadership provided by Chief Justice Rabner and the Court Systems Administrative Director Glenn Grant. The state judiciary created a joint committee of criminal justice comprised of representatives from all three branches of government, as well as other stakeholder groups. The committee issued a report in March of 2014 recommending that the state transition from a resource-based system to a risk-based method for determining pretrial pre release. 
Following the release of that report, the legislature passed and the governor signed into law a bill that adopted many of the committee's recommendations and voters in New Jersey approved a constitutional amendment um, allowing for pretrial detention of individuals in cases in which a defendant has been identified as a serious public safety and or flight risk in the community. The new law will go into effect in January 2017, I believe. As importantly, as importantly as the fact that they've got those, that constitutional amendment passed, um, the state has made it possible for thousands of its citizens who are currently being held in jail simply due to poverty to be able to take care of their court cases without being impacted by the criminogenic effects of jail on their low risk status, the criminogenic effects of being held in jail for, more, for two or more days and the, and this, and this, uh, the resultant um, impact on the likelihood that they will reoffend. By an order dated May 1st, 2015, Chief Justice Lee Softley of Maine established a similar intergovernmental task force to study, to study, update, innovate, and improve the criminal justice systems and procedures affecting pretrial incarcerations and restrictions in that state. The task force was charged with presenting proposals for improvement to the leaders of all three branches of government in time to allow for action on the proposals during an upcoming regular session of the Maine legislature. Already pending this legislative session is a bill to authorize electronic monitoring of defendants as an alternative to incarceration. Utah's Judicial Council created a multidisciplinary committee to assess pretrial release and supervision in Utah's courts recently and to identify possible alternatives, including the use of evidence-based risk assessment tools. And in November of, this, of last year, the committee submitted its report, which contains 12 recommendations to improve pretrial practices in Utah and includes reforms to minimize the impact of money in the pretrial decision-making process. And they're not alone. There's work being done in St. Louis County, Minnesota, Halifax County, North Carolina, where they're, where they're also examining racial and ethnic fairness issues in pretrial release decisions in collaboration with the American Bar Association's Racial Justice Improvement Project. And in New Mexico, the New Mexico judiciary has endorsed a proposal for a constitutional amendment similar to the one recently passed by New Jersey, which if approved by the legislature would be placed on the general election ballot of New Mexico next November. And this is just a snapshot, because there is another dinner tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that many people want to make, of the myriad activities being pursued by state courts across the country. Because states and its leaders, state courts and, and their leadership, recognize that the guarantee of equal justice under law starts when a defendant is first presented to court for arraignment and a bail decision. In 2014, on the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy Vera Conference, Attorney General Eric Holder convened the second national con conference on pretrial justice reform. In convening it, Attorney General Holder said, quote, by completely assess, by, comp, by competently assessing risk of release, weighing community safety alongside relevant court considerations, and engaging with pretrial service providers in private agencies as well as in courts, probation departments and sheriff's offices, we can design reforms to make the current system more equitable while balancing the concerns of judges, prosecutors, defendants, and advocacy organizations. We can help those serving on the bench make informed decisions that improve cost effectiveness and preserve safety needs, as well as due process. And we can spark, as Robert Kennedy did, not only a vital discussion, but unprecedented progress. I believe that time is now, and I believe that if we continue to work together and push forward, we will be able to end our country's reliance on money and in the injustice of detaining persons pretrial merely because they can't afford to pay for their freedom. Thank you. Judge, Chief Judge Wa Washington, not only for his great, great talk, but the great work you've done that you've described uh, tonight. It's really very inspirational. And he's also uh, graciously agreed to take a few questions. 
before our, our reception. So the floor is open. Yes. Uh, Judge, you referenced, oh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, Judge, you referenced uh, the uh, wrongful conviction problem. Uh, when people are held pretrial in jail, they will plead guilty just to get out. Uh, if we have such a, a comprehensive uh, reform as you've described, uh, what's the effect on the trial rate? Uh, well, let me say that. In a good way, I suppose. Well, <laughs> I, let, well, I think the positives of people being able to get out, maintain their jobs, provide for their families, prepare for their defense, again, the presumed innocent, are, are go without saying. I can tell you the experience in the District of Columbia is that ultimately, whether it's at that, uh, um, when they come in for that first or second hearing or at the beginning of trial, pleas are still, um, re, are still gotten. Uh, the, the government is able to get pleas if in fact the person believes, the person is in, um, guilty and has been advised by his, his lawyer appropriately. So it is not, it is not um, in any way um, undermined the plea process in the District of Columbia. So um, I don't think that that should be necessarily a real worry. Um, I, you know, I can't speak for other jurisdictions and there may be in, the, in other jurisdictions an increase in trials, but I know there's an increase in justice. A number of the reforms you described involve assessments of risk, not only as to non-appearance of trial, but also as to future dangerousness. The ability to predict future dangerousness is imperfect. Could you address the question of what protections you would like to see to minimize the risk that someone is wrongly predicted dangerous who actually would not commit any, any new offenses if released? That's a good question. I think that, um, the system that we've developed in the District of Columbia, which requires a high level of proof, clear and convincing evidence that they would be either a risk of flight or a danger to the community, is uh, one very, very important protection. Also, allowing an immediate appeal of that decision to determine whether the record supports that finding <coughs> is another significant and important part of why, of the due process we provide for people in the District of Columbia. It is an imperfect system. It is why it is so difficult to get judges to be comfortable with actually having to make decisions. Um, it's simple, it's, 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 you are protected when all you do is say, well, I didn't do anything, I just, it says $50,000 for armed robbery, I gave him $50,000 bond. My hands are clean, I'm absolved. It's much more difficult detention in a detention uh, hearing context or even in a release uh, without, you know, when, when you're going to release somebody, to actually sit down and have to think through those factors, it requires a robust, well-informed, uh, well-resourced pretrial services agency. That is important. So when we make the decision or when states make the decision, they're going to go to a system in which pretrial detention is, I mean, in which their bail is now going to be um, almost, uh, besides presumed, there's going to be decisions made to release in most cases. Communities, I talked about schemes for community supervision. Community supervision is important. So I don't wanna suggest that it, we're just gonna change the system, pass a constitutional amendment, everybody's gonna go out to the community. But it is true, the data does support the fact that many low and moderate risk, moderate risk individuals who are released pretrial don't require any supervision. So if you focus your supervision on those who are high, moderate, to high risk, we release high risk individuals. We release them with appropriate conditions so that, they, so that we can ensure they won't harm anyone else. And we use um, all manner of um, um, devices from tracking to um, courses, to um, uh, ensuring that they stay out of particular areas. We, and, we, and we have to enforce that, and the judges do. Your Honor, uh, one of former Chief Judge uh, Lippman's uh, reformation initiatives was 
a, a fairly immediate review of the bail set at arraignment where a defendant can't make it. But that, as I understand it, is to be done by judges of concurrent jurisdiction. I wonder if you have any misgivings about that particular aspect of it. Um, I, I don't. I think you have to tailor it to your court system and, and, and where the resources are. Anytime you have an, a some, another look, a fresh look, a fresh eye on that decision, it's got to be ultimately a better decision. I doubt very seriously a decision like whether to set a bail, set a, a money bond or to detain someone is something that the judges, and I was a trial judge um, before going to the appellate bench, is something that trial judges would feel uncomfortable someone else, uh, if someone else looked over their shoulder to ensure that they were making the right decision. I, I don't, uh, I can't speak, you know, judges are people too, so there are some that might have feel offended, but I think just, judges who are interested in justice will appreciate the fact that somebody is validating their decision. Well, thank you again. There's, some, there's a question over here. Hi, just Washington. Uh, my name is Sarah Higgins. I'm a 2L student here at NYU. I had a question about um, what role you think prosecutors could play in pre-trial reform and how you have seen prosecutors, if at all, contribute to pre-trial reform across the country. Well, another excellent question. As I mentioned, in the reform efforts in the District of Columbia, the United States Attorney, who is our local prosecutor, was very involved, along with the pretrial service agency director and the, and the director of our DC pretrial services agency. Uh, a former director, uh, professor here uh, at NYU was here earlier. She may have, had to, she may have left. Um, but prosecutors play a critical role. And I have to tell you, part of the coalition now moving this, bar this, this, um, this movement, uh, fueling this movement, uh, includes Prosecutors. It includes the national, the international association of sheriffs, and uh, their their law enforcement is very, very interested in making sure that we, they're detaining only those people that need to be detained, and that we are supervising in an appropriate way people be, being uh, released. Prosecutors play a key role because prosecutors ultimately have to make the decision to seek that detention. They have to marshal the evidence. And I can tell you the experience in the District of Columbia is they are much more willing to be objective in their views because it is a, still a burden to put together that case by a pretrial for a, det a detention hearing within five days and convince a court. So they are looking critically and only utilizing that process when they believe it's absolutely necessary. So prosecutors, through this effort and because of their interest, uh, are really targeting those people who we need to keep off the streets for many reasons. So prosecutors play a key role. Okay. The reception is uh, ready to be open, and please join me again in thanking. <laughs>